what i'm going to discuss right now is specifically for the second semester ma english delhi university and uh, this is one of the unit which you have to deal with shelley's defense of poetry this video is going to be very very specific for you please listen it again and again and if you have any queries write me down the uh, queries so we'll try to answer them and here we go for pb shelley a defense of poetry what is that shelley a defense of poetry was a reply to the attack made by contemporary thomas lopico how this debate started because my previous videos are also there where you will find that uh, how this debate of all poetry is going on here what happened in 1850 thomas lopico has written uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the article and this was published in Lit literary Mis miscellany and the title of the article was four ages of poetry in this four ages of poetry is talking about uh, four ages of poetry that i'll discuss later on and when shelley found that what he's talking is not so much like it's not a kind of uh, it is somewhat degrading poetry so uh, to counter the arguments which was given by thomas lopico in 1820 shelley wrote this uh, defense and that's what the main ideas are there so i'll discuss it later on but let just uh, go for the the sequel shelley a defense of poetry was a reply to the attack made by his contemporary thomas love peacock but we need to know a little more about larger context provided by plato attack on poetry and sydney's apology for sydney's apology came some 100 years later but he did have plato in mind all the time so that is also in your syllabus uh, sydney's uh, apology for poetry is also there and I'll, i have special videos there and i'll make many more videos so if you are able to listen all of these videos all together then only you will have a better idea about this so uh, and what is that thomas love peacock and and the concept which is created or is, is started from plato what plato is saying plato never liked poetry plato says poets are imitators and they are copier you know they are making copy of the copy Uh, so and then uh, aristotle's ideas are also there that we will separate video i'll make for plato and aristotle plato had attacked poetry as being an image of an image and sometimes which we can reason and self control so plato says that uh, poetry is an image of an image for example if you have a copy of this and then the the, the writing about this will be copy of it so that's how it's an image of image and something which we can reason and self control it appeals is to the emotion to men's lower self poet thinks that they have knowledge of all subject but that is far from being the actual case poetry is not a rational discourse nor it is a valid means of knowledge sydney's argument was the poet is a maker and sydney what say says poet is not an imitator sydney says poet sydney is countering the idea of plato and aristotle plato says poetry is an image of image uh plato uh, aristotle says poets are mimic mimicry artists they they do mimicry but city says they don't do mimicry they are not copier they are maker they are creator city's argument was that the poet is a maker he does not uh, imitate or express or discuss things which already exist in uh, he invent new things poet invents new things new ideas a new images new imagination the world invent or created by the poet is better world than the real one it is not the mere exercise of imagination that justifies the poet's exercise of his imagination to create a better world the imagination does not give us uh, an insight into reality but an alternative reality and a, a supervisor at one at that to so sydney's poetry is superior or a moral teacher to both philosophy and history because it does not deal with mere abstract propositions as philosophy does as philosophy does uh, but with the concrete example and uh, examples are not 
tied to fact it can make more apt and convincing than anything found in history the poet not only exceed the a philosophy in his ability to create the perfect example but also in ability to move the a reader to follow that example so the poet doesn't create only an example but he insists on make the reader to follow the example that is what the achievement of a poet in 1820 now i come to the point what Th thomas lovelock uh, said about poetry in 1820 shelley's close friend and noted novelist thomas P lovelock thomas love picock uh, 1785 to 1866 wrote an essay entitled the four ages of poetry thomas love picock uh, 1820 he wrote the essay four ages of poetry which appeared in single issue of literary uh, miscellany according to picock poetry passes through four distinct ages compared to four ages of man uh, these are the age of iron in which everything is crude and untutored so he says thomas love picock says poetry has four ages and one is age of iron which is crude and uh, compared to the iron age uh, these are the age of iron which everything is crude and uh, untutored the period of primitive and medieval folk ballads uh, and romances as in the period of infancy uh, so that is the infancy of the uh, poetry age of af after iron uh, there is a golden age first is iron age which is primitive and which is untutored a uh, second is golden age which is natural genius is a full blown the period epic and tragic form of a uh, fifth century so in uh, older age the iron age we can say folk ballads in uh, golden age we can say tragic form and epic form these are written then next come the uh, renesa uh, youth uh, age of silver in which the luxuriant growth of imagination is born through the uh, rules at uh, the period of virgil and uh, lucretius and of dryden and pope so first is folk ballads lyrical ballads second is epic tragedy epic poetry epic poems third is age of dryden and pope iron age gold age silver age uh, the second childhood of, of ex uh, extreme old age and decline classical period that is uh, the last one is bronze age in this bronze age poetry is declining and what is that at the uh, period of virgil and uh, then middle ages the age of bronze age poetry returned to an artificial simplicity second childhood of extreme old age and declining classical period age of wordsworth scott byron and others so that's what because this is the time period of wordsworth and you know shelley is appreciating wordsworth more than anything so that's how this might have and and this this age is called as middle ages and it is bronze age in which poetry is declining picock asserted that as in civilization uh, that as civilization advances poetry decline until this pursuit become a waste of time and intelligent and entirely uh, enlightened persons uh, whose time would be better spent in study of nature and social science so is comparing in the bronze age the poetry will be declining and that is the time of wordsworth scott byron and others and uh, then he says that the more the scientific approach is uh, growing the more the intellectual uh, growth is approaching poetry will be declining that is the idea of thomas love picock and the article is 1820 uh, four ages of poetry the essay excited shelley to what called a uh, sacred age in several letters to picock himself shelley described as here say an undiscriminating undiscriminating censor upon uh, the temple of immortal song to reply he wrote the uh, brilliant treatise a defense of poetry in 1821 see in 1820 the essay by thomas love picock came the title of the essay is four ages of poetry in 1821 he is replying a defense of poetry picock in his presumption had taken up defense of reason and enlightenment against primitive and superstition shelley turns the tables on him uh, the grand fabric of human civilization is not the product of reason but that of imagination uh, it is not the reason who's uh, who are the makers of history but men of imagination and that is the poet to establish the thesis 
as Shelley needed to define poetry, explain in creative process and evaluation in the terms of his influence and life of individual and society. In essence, Shelley's defense is a, uh, is a, a retort to Peacock. Uh, Peacock's rationalistic, cyn cynical and humorous description of decay and violent disappearance of poetry in age of utility. So Shelley says that, you know, what is the idea? The idea which are expressed by Thomas Love Peacock about poetry are cynical, humorous and is talking about decay which is totally false. No, poetry is not decaying. It is in fact rising high. Defining poetry, imagination and uh, ideal order. A defense of poetry starts with the distinction between reason and analytic operation of human mind and imagination, a synthetic process. Reason enumerates non quantity while imagination perceives and determines their values. Poetry is then defined in general a sense of expression of imagination. So, what Shelley says poetry is the expression of imagination. Poetry, quote, the expression of imagination and quote. Using Platonism uh, as his infrastructure, Shelley asserts that imagination has an uncanny and mysterious contact with the ideal order apprehended by imagination. A poet participates in eternal and infinite and one and poem is very image of life expressed in its eternal truth. This is to use the word poetry in a very wide and looser sense and Shelley does so deliberately. Poetry in its uh, universal sense denotes all manifestation of creative, uh, poetical faculty differs different sphere of life. Poets are not only authors of the language but also institution, institu uh, institutor of the law, originator of civil societies, founder of religious and innovators of the art of life. So what are the poets? Oh my god, beautiful definition. Please listen it again. Poets are not only the authors of language, but also the institution of law, originator of civil society, founder of religious and inventors of the art of life. As long as they in their respective sphere approximate to the reflect and ideal order, architecture, painting, music, dance, clip, sculpture, philosophy are form of civil life and all expressions of the poetic faculties. So what is that? Architecture, painting, music, dance, sculpture, philosophy are all form of civil life and they are all form of expression of the poetic faculty. In other words, all those who have contributed to the enrichment of human civilization are poets and conversely for that what is Shelley clearly implies uh, those who not gifted with the political or creative faculty has neither made nor can even any contribution to the human civilization. So poets are the most early, uh, they are contributing to the human, human civilization. It, uh, in a restricted sense, however, poetry is an expression of imagination in language and this Shelley's view on its most ideal and effective expression. He narrows down the circle of little further and distracting in terms of that of form of writing which use measured language. He dismisses the popular division and uh, poetry and prose and unattainable uh, because even prose writers like Plato and Bacon are measured language and art poets. This use of language is characterized by harmonious recurrence of this harmony harmonious recurrence of disharmony but uh, though preferably is not essentially poetry. Similarly, the poets because of their contact with the ideal order and their apprehension of the beautiful do not use language literally but metaphorically. That's what I'm telling you. You know, poetry makes the language metaphorical, imaginative, suggestive. So uh, that's what the beauty, you know, a reader can interpret things in their own way on the basis of their experience. So the same poem will be having different uh, meaning and understanding according to geography, linguist, culture, society, religion, gender and that's what the beauty of poetry. Such metaphorical language loses its freshness and passes the time of its need of the regular re renewal. If new poets should arise uh, to create a fresh 
and association with have thus disorganized language will be dead at all nobler purpose of human intercourses and again because poetry brings light and uh, find uh, from the eternal reasons where the owl winged faculty of calculations dare not even soar it is not like a reasoning a part be expert, uh, exerted according to the determination of will. On the contrary, the poet has to depend on uh, involuntary inspiration. When composition begins inspiration, uh, it's already on the decline and poetry tries to redeem the brief. Uh, vis uh, visitations of divinity in man. Poetry is a as if a divinity is visiting to that particular human mind that is what the poetry the moment you become a poet you have some kind of divinity in you uh, poetry differs from logic in this respect that is not subject to the control of consciousness and will the finest passage of poetry are not the result of labor and study but the record of the best and the happiest moments of inspiration okay i repeat this is a significant statement i repeat Poetry are not the result of labor and study. Poetry are, is not the result of labor and study, but the record of the best and happiest moments of inspiration. That's what the poetry defined according to Shelley. One of the uh, maturest inside of Shelley is that moral system and ethical codes cannot be th by themselves effect on revolution if it were so the world would have been a paradise uh, for this change the heart and minds of the people would have to be prepared first and poetry in his view brings about the transformation poetry brings transformation uh, this is obviously a religious ideal and points of romantic uh, pre delegations of claiming the poetry religious function we have to work out uh, we have to work out in words with writing. Shelley reinforces it and the time of uh, line of thinking culminates in Arnold's replacement of religious poetry, religion by poetry. Poetry effects this transformation by means of impar imparting pleasure, uh, not animal pleasure, but pleasure of the higher and noble kind. Pleasure, poetry gives you the pleasure of highest and noble kind a union of wisdom and delight what is there in the pleasure wisdom and delight is mixed there which arises by the poet's contact with the eternal and the ability to make his readers participate in the experience in this way poetry awakens and strengthens the imagination and inculcate the great moral force of love the great secret of moral is love and ongoing out of our own nature and unidentification of ourselves with the beautiful uh, which exists is thought action and pers persons not our own man to be greatly good must imagine intense and comprehensively a man to be greatly good is to think intensively and comprehensively he must be himself in the place of another and of the many the pains and pleasure of his species must become his own a poet is able to think and imagine in other persons terms of their pain and happiness and poetry and poetry administer to the effect by acting upon the cause so poetry is not simply pleasure it's up for the cause for the refinement of the human society human world human knowledge thus poetry which originates in imagination strengthen this faculty among those who are exposed to its influence poetry strengthen the faculty which is the origin of the moral nature of man in the same manner as exercise stand in the limbs, it is even needed to save the human personality and social fabric from corruption and from being reduced to a, a teproid ma mass. Shelley substantiate his argument by attempting a brief survey of the role of poetry in human civilization. Uh, to the modern age, however, its role and become more crucial. Far from being useless, a peacock right. It is needed more than even before today when calculating faculty and growing mechanism are corrupting and dehumanizing modern man. The civilization of uh, those experiences which have enlarged the limit of the empire of man over the external world has far 
want of the poetic faculty proportionately circumscribe those of the internal world and man having enslaved the element remain himself a slave poetry alone can uh, reduce modern civilization from the doom the cultivation of poetry is never more the to be desired than to period uh, when from the excess of the selfish and calculating principle accumulating of the material of external life exceed the quantity of the power assimilating then uh, it in the laws of human nature so that's how the poetry is defined by shelley nor does shelley concern with pico in that poetry his uh, age is experiencing a decay on the contrary he sees new birth and so you know thomas love peacock says in the age of bronze that is the fourth age where he says that poetry is decaying and this is the age of uh, words were shelley coleridge byron but shelley defends it and he says no it's not only uh, it's not only contrary to the idea it's not decaying it's creating but creating a new birth a new user or creative creativity around him and a defense of poetry concludes on the passionate optimistic note what is that i quote poets are the um, heroines of an unapprehended inspiration the mirror of gigantic shadows which a futurity cast upon the present the world which express which they understand not the triumph which signs up to battle and feel not what they inspire and influence which is moved not but moves poets are the unacknowledged legislature of the world this definition i have repeated innumerable time i in my videos what shelley says and that is the concluding remark poets are the unacknowledged legislature of the world why legislature legislative legislative assembly is important parliament is important because rules and regulations to organize human life is made there and poets are the unacknowledged legislature of the world the legislatures who are selected elected poet, politically we acknowledge them but no one acknowledge poets that's why he says poets are the unacknowledged legislatures of the world shelley's own poetry supplies a very good illustration of the role thus it uh, envisaged from the poetry which he tries to use consciously as a weapon of reform the whole of his poetic output from the short lyrics to longer poem and dramatic composition is surcharged with the passion of revolution uh, his ideal poet uh, his ideal poet sings hymns unbidden still the world is wrought to sympathy with hopes and fear it heeded not behind the apparent uh, uh, rhapsody there is an ideological structure as a western man a western man has shown the platonic concept that beneath the whole universe is there one a regulative principle is the underlying theme of shelley's argument hence poetry is not mere an art it's a vision and a vision of the perfect form of things of course shelley is taking about uh, shelley is talking about ideal poetry uh, from him poetry becomes an expression as well as molding influence of civilization uh, in its evolution from the most primitive barbarism he thinks now uh, he links the uh, decadence in letter to uh, decadence in social values and uh, instance of the a uh, censor of restoration comedy of manners whereas the occasion of the ideal order of censor fails poetry um, from falls uh, from its heights we would well we would do well here to know that the shelley is not indulging the rhapsodic dichotism but attributing ontological and epistemological values of poetry but the values uh, shelley's defense of poetry lies not just reestablishing the poetry as a part of fabric of society in process of history a velic think as velic thinks it is attempts of refutation of contention of peacock okay so what uh, vinnie relic says that it's a uh, contempt of peacock he is is refuting the contempt of contentions of peacock four ages the iron golden silver and bra uh, and brass in history of english poetry and who's felt that the lack poets where the childhood phase of primitive and medievalism is bring on instinct value and poetic apprehension of life uniqueness of the language of poetry 
you just google it what is lake poets and then you will find interesting facts about that the chief difficulty with defense is the grando grandiloquent style and it's extremely subjective assertion the terminology is unmistak and romantic we shall however discover that it is not so vague or imprecise as it has been made for out of we bring to sympathetic imagination it is a frame of reference belonging to an order and not rational positive and romantic shelly would have uh, that poetry has its origin in inspiration yet he lays a equal emphasis on need of the unity and organization in poetry it is not a mere letting loose of chaotic emotion in fact shelly uh, colrid realized the value of meter and versification factor dis- dis- disciplining the process of emergence of poem again the other romantic other romantic critics see makes no distinction between poetry and poet poetry because of quality that premi- premiates the entire universe and is not confined the uh, the rhythmic patterns in verse so uh, to verbal structure and this declaration of poets are unacknowledged legislature of the world is only an extens of the same example so shelley's defense of poetry is a defense of imagination against rationality poetry is expression of imagination and language the finest passages of poetry are the record of the best and happiest moments of the inspiration poetry imparts pleasure of higher and nobler kind poetry can rescue civilization from doom especially in times when the calculating faculty in growing mechanism 